Could I ask members who aren't speaking to mute themselves? Morris, your whistling's lovely, but you couldn't mute yourself. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I call it wheatland, not whistling. That's live now, Carl. Okay, thank you, um, Aimer. Um, and just to remind everybody that we're on Starleaf um, and the meeting's been virtual. I haven't received any apologies yet. Um, and the minutes, the draft minutes of the 21st of April are at, at page five of your pack. So without further ado, I'm just asking that members are content to agree the minutes of the 21st of April. So I'm just taking that as agreed. Okay. Um, item three, matters arising. There's no... Um, there's no uh, matters arising, but I just want to give you a quick overview on a couple of meetings that we've had. So in relation to item agenda item four, NDNA commitment um, regarding the simultaneous translation and the briefing by the Assembly Commission, um, you may remember that we provided an overview of the informal meeting with the Speaker regarding the NDNA um, correspondence um, and commitments in particular. Um, for the use of Irish and Ulster Scots in the Assembly. Um, I informed members that I'd requested from the clerk uh, for Memer to provide the committee with a note for discussion. And this can be found um, at page 12 of your pack. So you may remember at the last meeting there were discussions around the speaker's request to consider the introduction of the translation aspect to enable the Assembly our assembly business in Irish and Ulster Scots um, before looking at broadening the scope to other business areas. So subsequent to that, the committee agreed to request a briefing from the Assembly Commission regarding the practical and logistical and financial implications associated with introducing um, translation and interpretation in the Assembly. So the Emer's paper provides some context in relation to the briefing. So um, without further ado, and we're joined today by some of our commission officials. So we've got Garth McGrath, Director of Parliamentary Services, Simon Burroughs, Editor of Debates, and Susie Brown, Head of Communications. So uh, Emer, are the three um, officials, are they um, in the audience? Can we bring them in this spotlight, please? Just requesting that now. I can see Garth and Simon and it's Susie. You can see the three of them. So, guys, we're just asking people, um, if you're not speaking, could you put yourself on mute? Um, um, but I just want to advise you. Uh, you are very welcome to the meeting um, and we appreciate your attendance. Um, members, the briefing paper from the Commission can be found on page 21 of your pack. So, without further ado, I don't know who's going to kick off first, Garth. Is it yourself? Yes, Chair. Sure. I'll just, just make a couple of introductory comments. So, this is further to the Committee's request for a briefing on the simultaneous interpretation of Assembly Business in Irish and Ulster Scots. And Simon and Susie are going to cover two aspects of this in a moment. So first of all, Simon will cover issues relating to the committee's consideration of the scope of the simultaneous interpretation service to be provided. And then Susie will outline the infrastructure issues that need to be considered by the committee and the associated outline costs that we have pulled together for that. And I think it would be useful just to emphasize from the outset that throughout the paper, we have taken interpretation to mean oral translation as opposed to anything to do with translation of text. So just to put that into context. So without further ado, then I'll hand over to Simon. He'll start off by covering uh, issues relating to the committee's consideration of the scope of the, the service to be provided. Simon, you're on mute. Sorry, apologies, can you hear me now? Great, sorry Chair, I had problems with my microphone earlier. Okay, look, let me try and rattle through this quickly. Gareth's given me very little time uh, and there's an awful lot in here. Um, there are a number of fundamentals that will need to be 
uh, considered and some decisions taken on, such as simultaneous versus consecutive interpretation, passive versus active, the audience, the number and type of meetings to be covered, and indeed whether the service is spontaneous and arranged. And there's a bit of chicken and egg between that and the resources needed to provide the content of the interpretation as opposed to the equipment that Susie will talk about to deliver it. I think uh, NDNA has already said it's simultaneous, uh, it says simultaneous translation, but we'll take that to be interpretation. So in a sense, that decision has probably already been taken. Just so you know, simultaneous is where the interpreter speaks at much the same time as the person talking in the meeting and provides the interpretation. Consecutive is where the speaker stops and the interpreter then provides an interpretation. So it, it takes double the time, if you like. Um, passive or active? Passive is where the target language, i.e. Irish or Ulster Scots, uh, is the only language interpreted, or the only languages interpreted. Active is where the target languages, i.e. Irish or Ulster Scots, uh, and the main language, English, are, are all interpreted. And that's very crucial to resource implications because obviously an active service provision uh, requires a lot more interpreters. Both the Arachtis and the Senate in Cardiff um, provide a passive service. They take the view that there are no Irish or Welsh monoglots, that everybody can understand English, and therefore it is pointless spending extra money uh, on uh, translating uh, uh, English into Welsh because everyone can understand the English. Uh, the audience, this is more about the infrastructural side, but thought will need to be given to whether it's members and officials only in the various meetings that are to be covered, or is it the wider public? Uh, for instance, those in the public gallery or the broadcast output, and, and that will have knock-on implications. The resource also will depend on the number of meetings and locations to be covered. NDNA says simultaneous translation being made available in the assembly. Exactly what do, me do we mean by in the assembly? If you need to have enough interpreters to cover the number of meetings that might take place at any one time, so if you're looking to cover plenary sittings only, that's one thing, or at least looking to cover them to begin with. If you look to cover committee meetings as well, then that does have a, a resource implication. You could maybe have four meetings taking place at once, which will mean a minimum of four interpreters. And if you follow the Welsh example, they, they, they believe there should be two interpreters at each meeting, that would be it. Uh, it also will depend, the resource will depend on the quantum of the target language, i.e. Irish or Ulster Scots used, the frequency of that use and the scheduling of business. If business runs late, which is probably only likely to happen in plenary, there will have to be extra interpreters available because the interpreters can only sit for so long. Spontaneous or arranged interpretation is very straightforward. I think it, it, it would have to be spontaneous. And what I mean by that is that's where a member can speak in uh, a language of their choice without notice. In Scotland, if you want to speak uh, Scots or Gaelic, you have to seek advance permission and make an arrangement in advance. Uh, and the resource consideration is, is going to be clearly a huge issue. IT isn't developed enough at the moment for a machine to translate either Irish or Ulster Scots uh, to the, le the level of accuracy it would need to be done. So we need people to do it. Are those people out there? There have been some trouble recruiting in Dublin in recent years. Uh, would we have the market? Frankly, we would just have to go to market. Uh, as for Ulster Scots, I think it's only fair to say that the last time we tried an Ulster Scots recruitment competition, which was about 12 years ago, uh, it was not satisfactory at all. We didn't get anybody. So there could be difficulties there. And I was struck that the Welsh told us we really should start by getting a chief interpreter translator and we have limited experience interpreting and translation are, are, are highly skilled uh, professions particularly the interpreting so that would, um, we don't have that expertise at the moment in house and that will lead into other issues such as subtitling and reporting of languages that when interpreting is provided and it may well lead to discussion about sign language interpretation language policy and text translation I'm sorry, I've probably gone slightly over five, the five minutes I was given. I'm sorry for my speed, but there we go. And it's over to Susie for the infrastructure. Okay, thanks, Simon. Thank you, Chair. Um, afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for your time today. Um, 
Just very briefly, uh, Gareth's given me three minutes, so let's see how that goes. Um, we've always had facilities to provide for simultaneous translation at the Assembly, um, ever since the Assembly first came to be, essentially, first meeting of the Assembly. At the, mo at the moment, that facility is only um, provided to the Speaker's desk for simultaneous interpretation into English. And you, you'll probably have seen two interpreters booths in, in the gallery at the back of the chamber many times. That's the infrastructure that makes that happen. Um, happily, in, in 2008, cabling was installed in the chamber to enable an audio feed to be provided to each member um, in the chamber, but we've never used it. So now we can extend that facility to give, to give each member a live translated feed, a live interpreted feed. Um, each MLA would be provided with a headset to listen to the translated version or, of the speech or the contribution of the intervention being made in another language. It's safe to say that having this existing cabling and infrastructure in place does make any project to provide simultaneous interpretation much more straightforward, happily. Um, the system itself is very simple. Uh, every member will have a box fitted underneath the table in front of them. It'll be out of sight and in keeping with the, the furniture of the assembly chamber. Um, it will have a headphone socket and a volume control button so that members can individually control the volume of the translated feed. When a member makes a contribution in another language, that is interpreted and fed directly into the headset. All you have to do is plug the headset in and adjust the volume and you'll automatically hear the interpretation. The translated feed will require an additional web stream. Um, it will also go to all the places that our normal broadcast feed goes to. So it will go to the broadcasters. It will go to our internal TV system that you see around the building and so on. Um, in terms of, of a, a practical issue, I suppose, in terms of where the interpreters would need to be and, and where they would need to work from. Um, in a COVID-19 situation, obviously, uh, we have to think about working from home, but preferably interpreters would almost certainly need to be based in Parliament buildings. Um, remote working would put a bit of a delay into the system. Uh, and that may be problematic for the simultaneous nature of interpretation, but it also may interrupt the natural flow of members' contributions and debates. Um, in terms of costs, these are purely broadcasting and, and infrastructure costs coming in at about £43,000 at the minute. Um, in I can break that down for you by way of um, some work in the translator booths themselves at about 3000 some work in the press and public galleries by way of upgrading the existing PA system in there, which is fairly old now. Um, and we certainly want to do some work in there. That's coming in at about five. Uh, provision for the member works, that's the boxes, etc., under the desk, that's coming in at about 18. And then there's just our distribution, cabling, installation, general broadcasting coming in at two, eight and six, respectively. So that's 43,000. And that gives us a bit of contingency. Experience would show that contingency is a very wise pot of money to have when we're talking about broadcasting infrastructure. Um, just as an FYI, uh, we haven't included costs of headphones for members. Um, the feeling on that one being that so many members are making remote contributions via Starleaf Zoom that they may have their own headsets and may wish to use them. If that's not the case, they can be provided at a relatively low cost. Um, and we also haven't included any building works that might be required. Um, we expect them to be minimal. We expect those works to be minimal, um, but we haven't included them in costs. In terms of time scale, then, um, from date of order, we're looking uh, at about four to six weeks for parts to be delivered, and then installation works to take a further two weeks. So that pretty much takes us up more or less to the end of June. Um, so, members, that's me. Hopefully, that's helpful. Um, Happy to take any questions along with Simon and with Gareth. Thank you for your time, members. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Gareth, Simon and Susie. Much appreciated for that information. I don't know what it's like where you are, but it's snowing in Belfast. <laughs> <laughs> or sorry, it's Anyway, um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, take my first views. So I can't see you. Or can you see anybody who's raised their hand? No, raised hands, just the person. Sorry, what we need to do is then work out, as Simon said, the path um, is really, you know, just translating from either Irish, Jules or Scots, or from English, or Irish, Jules or Scots, and Ulster Scots to English. So, because 
not the state's greatest customs in Wales, um, that one day, the Arrakis, is that correct, Sure. Yes, the Arrakis, the Arrakis is made from Irish to English, but not the other way around. So are members, um, are, are you content to, are we content to agree that this should be the way forward? And um, bearing in mind what Susie has just said, there is a lot, a lot of the infrastructure there, um, but what the direction needs to be given or the um, views need to be given, um, which form of translation interpretation is needed. So given what Simon said, Raised a hand. Sorry, who? Jerry. Okay. Jerry, do you want to come in? Thanks, Chair. Um, listen, I'm happy to, to proceed, but uh, and I appreciate this maybe uh, slightly or majorly off topic, but um, uh, wise to have the officials in front of us today. Um, can we get a, an update uh, at some stage around internet connection in the chamber? Um, because it's very, very bad. Uh, and I, I know there may be some work being done, so appreciate it's not um, the remit of the presentation today, but maybe for some other stage, if you can maybe put something right into us. Thanks. <clears throat> and guys, that's what's called brass knacking it, but he's right. So um, he is right. The connection's wonderful. Um, in fact, it, depending on what side of the chamber you sit, you can get some, or if you have to go out the door, and that's not convenient. So, um, I suppose you've noticed that. I'm really just asking for members' views at this stage. So, has anyone else? Chair, sorry, Rosemary has raised a hand. Okay, Rosemary, would you like to come in? Thank you. Um, you see, you spoke about the translation. Um, what did we mean? I missed out. The same, it seemed to break up. Are you talking about translation? When you're talking about translation, you're talking about translation from Irish to Ulster Scots. Did, was that what you said? No, Irish or Ulster Scots. Irish or Ulster Scots. Well, if you were... That leads, that leads me on to another issue. We, we talked about uh, recruiting for both Irish and Ulster Scots interpreters. If you have one, surely you'll need the other and you can't have one without the other. Well, if we, the, last, if, kind of, yeah, the last recruitment if I picked upright was 12 years ago for Ulster Scots and it was very difficult. Yeah. So uh, I think what Simon and Gareth and Susie are saying, for these skills, you're going to have to go out to the market. Yeah. But, uh, Rosemary, if it's unfair, I just want to put it in record, if, um, if for example, we're going to judge the standards by 12 years ago, I think the market needs tested in this. Um, and if there's problems, we need to come back to it, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why I raised it because we need to know if the if the those people are available on the mar out in the market. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rosemary. Um, Emer, has anyone else indicated to talk? No, not at the present. Okay, so sorry, uh, sorry Chair. Sorry, Carol. Gary just raised a hand. Okay, Gary, would you like to come in? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Apologies, my sound, or maybe it's just my device or it's everybody's devices, I don't know, but I'm struggling to hear. Um, I, I, I picked up most of it. Um, so I, I just want to get some clarification, and apologies, Chair, because I've been out of the committee, as you know, for, for a while, so maybe this stuff has been covered. Um, and, and, and I appreciate the, 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 the um, costs that Susie has kindly articulated in relation to the um, the infrastructure piece, I think that's fairly clear. In terms of um, Simon raised a few points in relation to other areas uh, regarding um, the the resources, what that would mean in terms of whether it would just be plenary, whether it would be uh, other meetings outside of that, uh, committees, etc., all of that. Has there been any thought in terms of what it would take in terms of resources of interpreters, um, you know, what sort of costs are we looking at there? Um, you know, how many, for example, because we know the plenaries go on for at times for quite some time, uh, early hours at times. Uh, has there been any, um, you know, 
examples of what sort of budgets we're talking about and where does the money come from is the other uh, point that I wanted just to in terms of the resources where does the finances come from who's what budget is that thanks Jerry. Okay. okay no bother Gary um so I don't know who wants and I know Nicola wants to come in as well wants to come in and I see mom so um I don't know who wants to answer those questions that Gary raised Sure. If I, if I start off there, in terms of the uh, the budget, that is um, uh, ultimately will be a matter for the Assembly Commission, and the Assembly Commission has to provide the Assembly with the services that it, it requires. So, so basically, it would, it would require uh, a discussion between um, the, the the committee and the Commission, and there would obviously be a role for the Assembly in there um, in terms of of plenary business. Uh, so if, 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 if the budget is required and that's um, required by the Assembly, then it has to be provided by the Commission. In terms of the scale um, and the number of people, um, there are a number of paragraphs in the paper that outline the um, equivalent service provided in the Welsh Parliament and the Houses of the Oireachtas. And those are set out in paragraphs 27, 28, and 29 of the paper. Simon, do you want to go into that in a little bit more detail? Um, yeah, it, 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 it does depend on the extent. For instance, if, if we're talking about the plenary chamber and plenary debates only, we currently, well, actually, we're, we currently have a, a, a provision there. So what we would need over and above that would probably be to maintain that for Irish Ulster Scots is going to be a different beast, and these jobs will need to be scoped and evaluated before they get put on a pay scale. But working broadly in line with what the Welsh are, if if you're doing something across committees and the plenary chamber, it's probably going to be around about four hundred and eighty k in total for staff costs at the levels we think it would be pitched at. That could be a wee bit more, a wee bit less. If, and that could range down to if we were to provide a service broadly along the lines of what we are at the moment, uh, and, but just to ensure its continuity of supply, if you like, and assuming we can get somebody from Ulster Scots, you know, you would be talking about, I would have thought, 150k probably. Those are total staff costs, by the way. That's not just staff salaries. That's the total cost to the Assembly. So... Uh, it does depend a bit, and that's also based on current levels of usage. Um, if usage increases, and usage may increase if provision is there, uh, and I'm thinking mainly in terms of Irish here, Ulster Scots has not been spoken in the Assembly since Jim Shannon left, frankly, um, except for the odd expression or term, if you like, here and there. So that's, that gives you a ballpark, Gary, I hope. Yeah, it does, Chair. Sorry, thanks uh, for that. Saying that, that actually is very, very useful. It's the first time that I've obviously heard um, these types of figures being mentioned. Um, Gareth, you would mentioned in terms of the Assembly Commission, and I was reading through the papers, and I seen um, a readout from the Chairs with the Speaker, um, which obviously was very useful. Um, you know, without maybe in terms of confidentiality, I don't want to breach any of that sort of stuff, but how far has the Assembly Commission progressed this stuff? Are they waiting for uh, a steer from us? Or, you know, because assuming at some point they're going to need to know how much this is going to cost. Because I know that, look, it's, it's going to be once. Uh, this is a big room back on, on commitments. But we need to be realistic as well, just in terms of, we, I think we need, we, we need to know what the cost We need to know what we're saying up to. Susie's been very clear in terms of the capital stuff. Mm. But I would like to, like to know how clear we are in terms of resource stuff, and I'd like to know maybe in terms of the Assembly Commission where they're at as well. I, I mean, and just in summary, the, the the Commission has its budget agreed for 2021-22, and you know, just to be clear, there are no um, budgets within that for the provision of either. Um, simultaneous interpretation or for the, the capital element. But that's not to say that that can't be bid for as part of the, the normal process of 
um, in year monitoring and so on, and then um, mainstreamed within the budget for subsequent years. Um, so, for example, whenever there have been issues that have come up with, um, you know, systems are required for the chamber to do with COVID-19 and so on, um, though that, that has all been bid for in year. But, but just to be clear, and I've said this in the paper, the, the Commission has not been um, briefed on this and it hasn't included any cost for it within the, within the budget. And, and that's a process that would, would, be, taking, would be taken forward um, through the committee and through the Assembly itself. Okay, is that you done, Gary? Yeah, that's fine. Thanks, Chair. Okay, Tom, you're next. Uh, Chair, I'm trying to get on there, there, but you didn't see me, but that's okay. Look, they say, Gary has raised some of these issues that Simon has, has mentioned. One of the things that Simon mentioned about IT that is not developed to the level that needs to be done, there's, there's, there's work that needs to be done on that. And I think if I picked um, Simon up right and mentioned maybe something about have we got the people to develop the IT, maybe if, if, I, if I was right, maybe I picked that up wrong. But there's this whole issue of the developing of the IT to the level it needs to be done, the expertise and all that's required. Now, I'm just wondering, can Simon give us some more information on that, if you like, as to what really needs to be done to bring the IT up to standard that is required and what sort of cost that's going to be. Because while um, from Susie's paper we got a sort of a breakdown of what all of the infrastructure cost was going to be, and there's a lot of that that we've heard that's already in place, uh, I would be more keen to know from Simon's end and get a... I would like to have seen a paper from Simon with a breakdown on it of really what is going to be in order to make this that is going to be able to work within the uh, within the chamber or within the committees or whatever. Could I, could I just answer that, um, Chair? Uh, Tom, uh, actually, when I was referring to IT, what I was referring to, there is no IT problem. There is no IT problem in the provision with a simultaneous interpretation service. That's Susie will cover that up. The IT I was referring to was that eventually, you know, there is automated. There are automated translation systems, and one day this service will be provided by a machine. Make no mistake about it. It's the same as auto automated speech recognition. So there, is, so there's no IT problems. The, 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 pro the problem simply is this needs to be done by humans and you need to put the human beings in place to provide the service. The IT exists to do it and it's, it, it is there apart from the extra stuff that Susie would have to put in to widen the communication of that. So there aren't IT position or problems from the point of view providing the interpretation. Yeah, the, the 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 only the only obstacle that you're facing then is people to be able to do the interpretation. Yeah, and that's that's running in at quite a cost. Yeah, we currently have one point four people in post to do that uh, on the Irish side. We we don't have anyone on the Ulster Scots side yet. Okay. No, not yet. No. Yeah. That's right. Yes. Okay. Tom, have you any more questions? Not at the moment, Chair, thanks. Okay, Nicola, you were looking to come in? Yes, thanks, Chair. Um, thanks, Gareth, Simon and Susie for the update, Chair. Um, I think that's a really positive development. Uh, I think it's a service, really, that's it's overdue a long time. Um, um, I just want to check, Susie, did you say that the service could be up and running by June of this year? We could have the parts and stuff in. Um, we think delivery of, we think if we say we're to order stuff today, we're looking at four to six weeks for delivery of parts and then a further two weeks for installation and contingency and planning. So essentially we, we could have the system up and running early recess if all goes well. What I will okay. say there too, and it'll come as no surprise to you because I think I briefed in on this the last time as well when I was talking about something else. Um, just there is a general shortage of parts and things are taking longer to be delivered than normal. Um, 
we certainly can we've certainly uh, from a broadcasting perspective experienced some really significant delays in getting kit in the door um it's fairly fairly straightforward kit so there are the indicative timelines that we have but we always put a bit of caution into the system to share just given the experience that we've had with getting kit into the building but four to six weeks for parts and then a further two weeks for installation and testing we think that's fair enough, I suppose, so easy, but it's good, it is good to have that kind of indicative timeline. Um, and it's great to know that much of the infrastructure is already there um, for the service. Um, I'm not sure who's best to answer this, but if we were to agree with the, the passive um, translation service, would it be difficult to change it to an active one? Or um, do any of you know that? I mean, the only, the only issue is really it's, it's of a very different scale. Um, and, I, and I think Simon and Simon can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I think to, to change from uh, passive to active would effectively be a doubling of the staffing resource. Simon, do you want to add anything? Yeah, it, it would it would probably be more because you would need, uh, and, and a lot of this is based on discussion with the Senate in Cardiff. You would need two interpreters. Let's say we're talking about plenary. You would need. Technically, you would need two interpreters for Irish. You would need two interpreters for English. And those people, particularly those interpreters interpreting from English to Irish, if you had an active service, they would probably need to have spells of no more than about an hour, an hour and a half in the translation booth because virtually everything is in English. So there would be a, a severe pressure on those. So I would have thought that... Um, even at a very basic service, yes, you, you, you would need to have at least four translators or interpreters, sorry, uh, available for plenary proceedings and they would rotate during the day with two in, two out. So going to active will severely ramp this up. Yeah, but, I guess. Yeah, but there's no other, there's no other legislators have active translation at the minute? N not at the moment, sure, no, not at the moment. Okay. So there's been a few, is there any other questions there by members? No hands raised. Okay, so there's some questions that people are still looking information on. Sorry, Gary's hand has just gone up, pardon me. Sorry, Chair, just one final question, and it's just to Simon. Simon, you had mentioned, I don't know what's wrong with this, but you had mentioned 1.4 interpreter for Irish, is that right? You mentioned that there are currently 1.4. The question I'm trying to ask is uh, the, the budget that uh, Gareth had mentioned um, would need to be requested. If there's already 1.4 in place at the moment, then do the, can those people cover the services that have been asked for? Or would there have to be additional on top of you know what we currently have? Does that make sense? Maybe yeah, it does. It does make sense. I, I would estimate that if you went, if you went for the current level of provision, and um, we that the, the the usage of of Iris and these two people are solely for Irish at the moment. We just haven't had the need for Ulster Scots. Frankly, there, there's no usage. Um, if, if we would probably need to have. Uh, we would probably need to have an extra post and a half, I think, in the official report if interpreting remained with us, providing we had security of supply. And one of the people who supply services at the moment is agency, and we have one person employed full time, uh, and 0.4 of a person through an agency. Uh, so we would have to go out and work out how we increase that slightly, I think, to give us the contingency we need for the service. Because if, if somebody if somebody gets sick or goes off, then you're, you're, you're gone. Okay, and what happens if someone uses Irish at the minute, and say, for example, Christopher Stalford's in the chair, what happens at the minute? Uh, it's a retrospective. Translated feed through the interface at the back. But that service isn't actually being provided at the moment. Okay. Because it can't be provided, or, or, or people aren't, uh, well, haven't been in the building. Now, we can get that back, but what we do do is we ensure that after every contribution, they are all translated, and if there's something amiss, 
we will get that pretty quickly and we would then alert uh, the business office or the speaker's office so that they could come back. But if somebody said something naughty, they shouldn't have there and then. Uh, at the moment, that you know, it, there would be a time delay before that was picked up on. Yeah, but I, I haven't heard anybody saying anything naughty in Irish. No, no there hasn't been. Sure, no. there hasn't been. The, no. The, the, um, no, we would identify that as a practice. The convention is that the member will translate, uh, and that's been the case since the very early days, yeah. what they have just spoken in the language. And if we think there's a difference, then we will highlight that. But I can't, in, in all my time, I really can't remember that happening. Yeah. Okay, and you're there a long time, Simon, aren't you? Uh, <laughs> maybe I'll take it as a compliment. <laughs> yeah, you are, you are. 2001, 2001. Yeah. So listen, members, the questions that people are asking is, what is a, even though a lot of this is in the paper, but people are asking for additional information. So they're asking for additional information in terms of exactly what's happening in other legislators, what the current position with translation is at the minute, what what potentially will have to be done in order to attract um, interpretation for additional Irish speakers, but certainly for Ulster Scots. And <clears throat> what else is it we need um, to do in terms of, that was a question that you posed to Gareth about getting the money to the commission to do that. So, have I captured everybody's queries, right, or to have I left anything out? And Chair, if we could get the overall cost that this is going to cost to deliver this on a yearly basis, I mean, are we talking about half a million here? Well, it sounds like it, but it could be less, so we just need to try and bottom that out and try and help for our next meeting, if that's possible. Chair, Chair can I just say that, that, that that cost will depend... If we're talking about the plenary chamber only, yeah, that will be a different base from going to committees. If you move to committees, you will be talking about half a million pounds, I think. Yes, but, we're, but this stage we're just talking about assembly business because it was in the NDNA. So, right. Well, if, if if the definition of assembly business is purely in the assembly chamber, then then that is a different base. We can we can do something. We can work out costs and that. It'll, it'll certainly sure. not be half a million. It's, so it's not up to me to define. All I'm saying is that. No. So just to be clear, it's not up to me to define assembly business. I'm saying, if you could do it for the the, the committees and then others, or sorry, if you could do it for the assembly and if you yeah. want to include the okay. figures the committees as well, so people can have all the information. Um, I think that's what I heard people saying anyway. But certainly, okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Is that far enough? Yeah, that's fine. No, we can. Listen, so thanks very much um, for the information you provided um, for today. And thank you for getting the additional information. And hopefully, when that's ready, um, if you don't mind coming back just to answer any queries that members may have. No problem. Thanks, Jim. Okay, so thank you, Gareth, Susie, and Simon, on behalf of the committee. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you Okay, Emer, um so we just to have it on the, the record, we're going to get additional information. Um so we'll just we'll just hopefully get those questions responded to and then come back to this. Yes, um at this point I'm not sure you can move to seeking whether or not there's committee agreement to go forward at this point with ID no, additional so fair enough. I think in fairness to the committee, um, some of the members should create this by saying there's no issue with NDNA, they just need to know the full costs. And I think that's far enough. So we'll come back to it when we get those costs and then put the decision to the committee. Is that far enough? Okay. Okay. So agenda item five, private members' bills. So you will be aware at the... <clears throat> Review of PMB, the committee agreed to schedule a briefing from the Bills Office on existing processes. And I just want to remind members that we also agreed for EMER to provide a paper. So that's at page 35. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And at page 56, 
um, as a briefing from the Commission. So we're joined by Frank Geddes and James, sorry, Gil, Gil Sanson. Sorry, James, how do I say your surname? It's Gilson and Chair. Gilson and, okay, yes. thank you for that. Um, so uh, without further ado, um, if we could bring the officials into the spotlight. And they're not in power. Okay, so thank you, Frank and James. Um, if you'd just like to brief the committee, please. Yeah, thanks very much, Chair, and thanks to the committee for having us along today. Um, we've obviously flagged up the briefing paper that was provided there, and just to sort of set out at the beginning that the intention behind that was really to recognise the committees at the early stage of its review on the uh, private members' bills, and was a bit of a food for thought paper, I think, on the basis of these are the types of issues that come up in, uh, in terms of private members' bills, things you might want to consider, obviously be looking at other jurisdictions, etc. Uh, so it's really just to introduce that discussion and a little bit also then about how the private members bill process currently works within the assembly. Um, so I propose just to say, give a bit of a, an overview chair and then pass across to James who will just talk uh, for a short time about the process currently that we use. So I think the first thing obviously that the paper discusses is the, is the context of private members bills and particularly the increasing demand for them within the Assembly. Um, I think the last complete mandate on this has seen near an increase of going on for almost a third in terms of the number of initial proposals of bills. So, I mean, that's a positive story. Members are clearly engaged with the process um, and, and interested in developing private members' legislation, which, of course, is a, a central part of, of a modern democracy. So. That's a good, a sto good news story. And then the other side of that coin is how do we respond to that, resource it, and support it? And that's really what the committee is, I think, minded to look at now. How do we get to sort of the best fit for us in terms of resourcing that going forward? So a few things about the model currently is, so members may be aware, I know, for example, Jerry um, has experience of the of the process in this, this time around. Um, it it's, uh, obviously works under the speaker. Officials will advise the speaker on progress, works within a structure and sets of deadlines, etc. Um, so that's, that model is flexible in the sense of, you know, we sort of can assess how it's working over a period of time. But it also raises issues about how we prioritize resources. At the moment, we have around 24 private members' bills in the system. We have a short mandate. We're doing our best to sort of support members. Um, get to get their bills introduced um, within the short time we have left. So some of the issues that come up always is how do you program that across a mandate? So how do you start at the beginning of a mandate and give members a fair chance to access resource and support for private members' bills, but also manage the flow of that over a mandate and actually in a fair way? So that's one of the issues, you know, it's about resourcing and planning. Um, the other thing is to say that um, is at the moment we've put additional resource into, Assembly Commission has into the private members bill process and that has sort of led to a lot of um, uh, increased support for members and hopefully what we're there focusing on is getting the lead time down and improving the service to members over time. So we're in a bit of a pilot period. The paper talks about the previous period, but we're now, um, since the resumption of the Assembly in last year, we're in a period of putting additional resource in, refining the model we have in place, which is a private members bill unit, supporting uh, a number of bills across the piece and reflecting on that. So we're, we're thinking about how to improve that going forward. So the committee's work in that respect is perfect timing because by the start of the next mandate, hopefully we'll be, have a clear position as to where we want to take it. Uh, and I think the emphasis here is we can look at uh, approaches elsewhere, and I think we mentioned in the paper of there's merit in looking at, at, at potential approaches from elsewhere, but also bearing in mind our particular uh, circumstances in the Assembly, the consociational model, the value placed in private members' legislation, and then thinking about how that would work across the five-year period. And broadly, there's trade-offs in that, uh, Chair, and I think that's an element of, you know, the wider you are, the less deep you can go in terms of your support, but equally, you don't want to narrow it um, too much either. So it's striking the balance and getting the balance right for the Assembly. And just finally, before I pass over to James, some of the principles that's suggested at the back 
end of the paper are what level of service do we want to give members um, and, and settling that. Then how can members access that in a fair way that they're content with? Um, communication with members, what's expected of, of them? What will the service give them? What's the sort of time frames involved? How will that translate? And then planning that across a mandate. So getting the, the right model in place to make sure that we can support as many uh, members as possible and, and taking forward private members' bills. So that's sort of a flavor, a bit of a tour of the key okay. principles to it. And okay. James, you say something if you have time for uh, about the current system. Yeah, James, so anything that, that Frank hasn't covered, can you come in on it, please? Yes, Chair. Um, and hello, members, as well. Um, yeah, the current system that's working in this mandate is really divided into three three stages. Uh, members are asked to um, produce an initial proposal, uh, and the initial proposal is the document that the member will uh, work with the bill unit on, um, and also will be provided to the research, assembly research and to the assembly legal services. So immediately the member is getting input from those two um, areas of the assembly, in addition to their own um, to their own thoughts and research. Um, <clears throat> and this takes place confidentially, which is an important aspect. I think um, it allows the member to um, to have those conversations uh, uh, securely in terms of developing the bill and trying to really get a feel for. Uh, an area of policy that they want to they want to really target. Um, members are also in this stage um, expected to engage with the Human Rights Commission and the Inequality Commission for input uh, and thoughts. And we've noticed in this mandate that a lot of the contributions from those two commissioners has been very detailed and very very constructive, uh, which is most welcome. And also, the member is asked to engage directly with the minister of the relevant department. It's important that the that the member is, uh, if you like, not operating in a vacuum, but is taking account of what may be uh, under consideration by ministers and, and the relevant departments too. Um, so the idea is that there is not um, unnecessary duplication, if you like, of work that's going on, but that members are secure when uh, developing their bill, that they are taking on an area of policy that isn't being addressed elsewhere within the, in, it, within the assembly. Um, the next stage is the consultation, uh, and at this point, obviously, the confidentiality ends, um, and the uh, member is really at this stage look is given eight weeks, uh, and is, so it's different to the statutory uh, engagement that a department would have, which is twelve weeks and has various other section seventy five um, constraints uh, involved. Um, and over this eight weeks, the idea is that the, the member is really testing public opinion and allows, again, more contribution and to develop the, to the, to develop the bill. Uh, and we'll see quite a lot of changes to bills at this stage. And that is, that's a good thing, uh, if you like, because it's suggestive that uh, members are listening to contributions from, uh, from others, be they charities or individuals uh, and so on. And we get... Um, contributions vary from the, from a few hundred to to many thousands we've had in this uh, mandate to some of the consultations. So they definitely do uh, gain traction uh, and provide very um, concrete uh, evidence, if you like, for members to help them a develop, but also think about maybe alternative approaches or additions to the bill that hadn't previously been considered. Um, following this, then, the member produces their final proposal. Um, and this document is really the, uh, the summation of all the work that's taken place and should chart the journey from the initial proposal to the final proposal, including any amendments in thinking uh, because of through consultation or from various advice that's been received. And it's that document that goes to the uh, speaker, uh, to seek funding for the private member's bill drafting. Uh, <clears throat> if approved by the speaker, it moves on to, if you like, the third stage. And this stage is where the bill is given, given over uh, to a panel of drafters. Uh, and one of those panel will be selected uh, to draft the bill. Uh, <clears throat> and there is interaction throughout with the 
with a member. It's a very um, uh, iterative process. So the back toing and froing is, is very much part of it and to be welcomed. And it allows the member to, to engage with a professional, uh, if you like, an expert in not only the legislation language and the, 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 the drafting of it per se, but also the interaction that this bill may have with existing pieces of legislation and so on. And by using uh, external drafters, we feel that we provide, or the, the, the process provides a significant degree of added value um, to, to the member. Uh, and again, it allows the member through these engagements to take forward their bill to introduction, uh, <clears throat> you know, with, with a great deal of background knowledge, not only in the subject area, but also in the assembling of the bill. Uh, and that chair is just a, an overview, a, a gallop, if you like, through the through the okay. process as it stands. So thank you, James and Frank. Um, so I suppose what we're seeking to try and ascertain is whether or not the information provided in both the research papers is current and relevant enough um, for the committee to refer to during its review of the private members builds, or rather at this stage we should seek to refresh and update these papers. So or any other views for that matter that I haven't covered. So I'm just going to open it up to members, please. Can you see anybody? There's nobody indicating at the minute, Carol, no. Okay. Rosemary, pardon me. Rosemary has her hand up. Sorry, Rosemary, go ahead. You're okay. I'm just wondering, would it be better to have to refresh, have the exact up-to-date information to help us make decisions? No, it's fair enough, Rosemary. Um, that's one of the options I put to you. Um, so, as well. Amer, do you want to come in? Yes, I think it would be wise to revert back to yeah. the research service and ask them to update those papers. Okay. Um, I think yeah. Yeah. For that. yeah, I think that's fair enough. Do members agree that we do that? Agreed? Okay. Um, Jerry's asking to come in. Sorry, Jerry, I'm trying to look to say I can't see you, so go ahead. Yeah, just quickly, thanks, Frank uh, and James, for that, and, and work on my own bill. Appreciate the, the assistance, obviously. Um, but I, I think there's... Um, I mean, I'm for extra uh, information, Chair, and, and, and Rosemary's proposal is, is, a, is a fine and fair one, but I think it's clear that there's been uh, more utilisation, obviously, of, of private members' bills. I think it, they're up 30%, I think, was the, was the figure that we heard. And I know there was an increase uh, on staff, I think, last year. Um, and obviously, I'm assuming one of the considerations for, for us will be you know, whether there needs to be more staff and more resources. Um, and I would be sort of... Um, indicating that probably we do, um, which isn't a bad problem to have because people are looking to make legislation. So I'm all for that, but I think the indication seems to suggest that um, uh, there's, there, there is an, an, an obvious increase in, in usage of some as well, which is, is a positive. So thanks. Yeah, and also, I mean, I agree with Jerry. Uh, I mean, that first of all, we have written uh, continuously to 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 ask for legislation that could be coming through, and that hasn't been forthcoming. You are absolutely right. It's a democratic um, entitlement of members to bring private members' bills forward, and we've also heard from ministers who have said they intend to bring legislation forward only to withdraw it at the last minute. So all that needs to be factored in, but the more staff and choice that members have to bring legislation forward to better because that's it's in the title of her name. We're members of the Legislative Assembly. And certainly if there isn't a um a raft of legislation coming forth from the executive, then that should in theory widen the entitlement for more PMBs. But the committee's asked to consider getting a refresh um um of the, the research papers and uh, indeed, just to go back and you know do whatever else we need to do to give people additional information. So, um, I mean that's that's what we've got consensus for at the minute, and I think it's a good thing that there's more PMBs going through in this mandate because that's been definitely one of the criticisms of us all through no fault of our own, um, particularly when 
things are agreed um, by governments and parties, and then they're they're. Uh, people are shafted at the last minute. So we just need to make sure that there's flexibility there in the event that that, that, happen, that doesn't hopefully happen. So Frank and Jack, th or James, sorry, thanks very much again. Um, uh, just to say on the record, there's a strong appreciation of the work that you are all doing. Um, and as Jerry said, the growth in terms of the staff that's needed can only be a good thing because it gives us all a bit more support and a bit more experience. So, Emer, is there anything else or anyone else wanting to look in before? Oh, sorry, Linda. Linda's looking at Linda, apologies. Just a very quick point, and it's actually slightly outside the PMB stuff, but, I mean, there, there certainly is, I think, need for additional staff, even in terms of the the departmental legislations coming forward, the, the work that has to be put in in terms of maybe committee amendments or even private members amendments from staff as well. And again, just to support what you've said there, Carol, the work that's done by, by the staff and the assembly around this stuff is phenomenal. And it is it is appreciated and it's usually very quickly turned around, to be fair. So I just want to place on the record our appreciation to the staff that do put, put the work in behind the scenes. Thank you, Linda. So, James and Frankie, so we'll carry all that back to the rest of the team, no doubt. <laughs> yeah, um, thanks very much, Chair and the members, for that. That's useful. Um, I suppose the only thing I would just add, Chair, before we, we close is, um, you know, we're happy to come back to the committee and we've said in the paper, you yeah. know, I think we get to the stage of looking at other jurisdictions, looking at what we have and deciding on the best fit for us. That's a, that's an opportunity for us to have a further conversation in more detail at that point, I think. No, no, 100%, Frank. 100%, yeah. So, listen, thank you very much again, um, and we'll look forward to seeing you again in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Frank. Thanks, James. Emer, um, is there anything else that we need to do in terms of this item? I um, didn't agree the list. There was a project plan in one of the appendices, Carol. Yeah. Didn't agree the list. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Or so, are there any further stakeholders or consultees to be added? Um, well, can we just agree the list, that, sir? And if there are any that people feel it need to be added, that there's a flexibility for them to do so, rather than being too prescriptive? Because particularly if members are bringing forward a succinct case of a bill that's a bit niche uh, and they're not on the regular consultee list, they need to have the flexibility to do that. So our members agreed with that? Yep. Okay. Emer, does that help? Yes, thank you. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> Emer, you can count that I move on to Agenda Item 6, Member Statements. So at our last committee, we discussed a number of issues regarding our review of Member Statements. And this included the potential approach to managing these statements as an item of business, the frequency in which member statements may be scheduled, at what point during a certain statements may be scheduled, and any formal restrictions which could or should apply to the content or use of the statement. So the committee agreed for EMA to bring back additional information on outstanding options to enable us to consult with our parties and groups and allow this committee to make a an informed decision at the day's meeting. So at page 64, Emer <clears throat> has provided a paper which outlines the options available to the committee and provides some additional information following consultations with officials from the Speaker's Office and indeed the Business Committee. At paragraph five is the potential approach outlined by the Speaker. But firstly, the committee should consider um, <clears throat> excuse me, whether is content to formally agree this approach. And if the committee is content, then further discussions are indeed required respect in respect to frequency, scheduling and restrictions. So, um, so members, we deferred this last week on the basis of giving people the flexibility to have discussions with their colleagues and parties. So with that said, are members content if we agree the recommended approach? Agreed. Agreed. Okay. So what we need to do then is 
relate me look at frequency. So at paragraphs eight and nine of Amer's paper, there are two options in relation to the frequency with which member statements may be scheduled. So for example, option one would allow this business to occur routinely with an agreed frequency, for example, at each sitting, with one sitting per week, at one sitting per month, the approach which will provide certainty when member statements should be scheduled. So we've got that. Option two, like any other rooms of business, such as private members' motions or German debates, would be for the business committee to determine how frequently member statements are scheduled. Um, so with this approach, statements would only be scheduled when business committee agreed it was appropriate. So if we're going to try and strike a balance between the two options, the committee could recommend that member statements are scheduled on a weekly basis, for example, unless the business committee agreed that due to time pressures on the order paper or other exceptional circumstances it wouldn't be appropriate. So I'm just throwing it back out yes, again for your views, please. And yeah. again, yes, Tom, go ahead. Yeah, Chair. Uh, having looked uh, at this and, and given some consideration, we're happy to go with option two on this, where it gives the business committee some wee bit of control over the whole issue uh, in, in relation to business within the assembly that uh, perhaps if we, we take a likes so, of um, issues coming through from the justice uh, committee that's the, and the justice side of things are going to be lasting, you know, going to take quite a, a bit of time and all. And I think the business committee does need that wee bit of flexibility in this in order to be able to determine um, you know, what, what the amount of business is going to be coming through and after all we do have uh, members of every party on the business committee so you know the agreement can be sought there uh, on this and uh, we'd be quite happy to go for option two. Um, so just to remind people Emer, when a member is making a statement how long are we are talking about here? Uh, three minutes, up three to three minutes. minutes per member, total time, total duration of time, 30, 30 minutes. Yeah. Sorry, Carol, both Jerry and Linda were indicating to come in. Okay, Jerry, go for it. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Emer, for the briefing. Um, I'd be, we'd be more, rather, Chair, um, supportive of, of option one. Um, I think there should be a, a stipulation uh, for how often um, the statements um it should be allowed to occur, and that's no reflection on the business committee. But I just think it needs to be uh, stated, and, and I think there, there's scope for um, at least uh, one sitting per week, and, and possibly two sittings, um, uh, both sittings per week uh, for member statements to occur. I mean, I'm just basing it on uh, every time I ring up the. Uh, um, it's Nick Mifford now, isn't it? You know, asking how many, uh, how many matters of the day, how many urgent orals, um, and there's multiple um, on both occasions. So I would be for uh, option one um, with an agreed frequency. My preference would obviously be uh, at each sitting. I understand that uh, they, that may not be everybody's uh, uh, decision, but if you have a, a, um, some flexibility that's a, that allows the business committee or, 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 the, or the speaker or whomever to kind of um, alter with that, I think, uh, you know, my the point I would like, like clarity on, I suppose, is that, you know, if we stipulate for two um, uh, sittings per week, uh, there has to be um, statements, uh, but there's only uh, statements on, on one sitting per week. I mean, what happens in that scenario? Um, is that down to the business committee and is down to their discretion? Um, so I, I would just like a bit of, bit of clarity on that, but, but broadly speaking, option option one be supportive of. Thanks, Jerry. Linda, you were looking in. It's okay, Chair, it's covered. Thank you. Any, any other member? Looking to speak, Emer. Sure, I'm not sure if you can hear me. Sinead, did you join us? Yes, sorry, I have. Yes, sorry. Apologies for being late, uh, Chair. Chair, um, just on that option two, I think. Um, when we considered this, we did look at option one, and I can I see where Jerry's coming from there. But I think option two is a good starting place on this and then once we understand the frequency of use because option one does appear to be a bit messy from the speaker's perspective I think you have to 
stand down, standing orders every time if it's not being utilised and it appeared just a bit messy. So I think option two and to allow it to take legs and it may come a time where it would need to be reviewed if it was a frequent piece that was being routinely used that it might warrant moving to a similar option one. But I think at the initial stages, definitely option two would be our preference. Thank you. Okay, is there any other um, views or... Rosemary has indicated to come in. Yeah, thank, thank you. Um, I would go for option two. My only problem with option two is if it was confined to one day per week and something particularly has happened on the day that we're not taking statements, that would be a concern. Yeah, and we still have the, the facility for matters of the day as well. And we still have the facility for urgent oral questions. Okay. Uh, so it's not that member statements member statements are in addition to what we'll have yeah. rather than placing anything. Yeah, that's that's fine as long as we have those facilities, yeah. So um I mean it seems it seems that <clears throat> I mean, are people prepared to even look at a balanced approach in terms of <clears throat> between the two? You don't recommend that statements are on a weekly basis unless the business committees agree that due to time pressures or whatever or other exceptions, circumstances, it wasn't appropriate? Or is there, is there I mean, you just need to let me know. I can't see. Gary, is that indicating to come in, Chair? Gary, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, what I was just going to suggest was, look, I, I don't think there's an issue um, with recommending to the business committee that it happens as regularly as can be. Uh, Something on the business committee, I know that there can be uh, pressures, you know, I think of staff, even you know, working hours, you know, for MLAs, it's not maybe, well, it is an issue for us as well, but particularly staff in the building. Um, there's been times where the business has been just so much that that they haven't been able to squeeze in the member's business, for example. Um, so I, I think a mixture of the two, but I think that option two is the better option, but with the suggestion that, it should be encouraged that private members and statements should be facilitated if it's practically possible. That would be the suggestion that I would have. Yeah, see, the difficulty I have, it, even not was not what Jerry said, but every party gets up and waffles and throws in the name of legislation and extends it. So at least with member statements, it will be time-bound and it may cut some of the waffle that people use to get up um, during legislation because there's very few debates that are actually linked to the specific uh, draft of legislation that everybody, every party's uh, member sticks to. Um, and that's the only difficulty that I have. I don't want anybody getting squeezed out, but there's a distinct lack of discipline when it comes to legislation. People just use it for a free-for-all. So um, option two is allowing the business committee to determine the timing of this item of business um, and taking, so truly really we're, we're actually, just to be, we're, we're actually giving our authority to the business committee on member statements. We're ducking out of a decision, in my opinion. Um, Carl, both uh, Jerry and Linda have indicated a hand up again. Okay. Linda, Jerry, who's going first? Go ahead, Linda. Oh my God, Jerry, thank you. Um, just I agree with what you've just said, Carol, to be fair. I think that if, if people were more disciplined when it came to the legislative process and actually stick into what the legislation is about, it certainly frustrates me. And I, I tend to keep my contributions to most things pretty brief anyway. And I, th and, I, and I don't see why, for the most part, that can't be done. You know, because you have a certain number of minutes or if you're, Unlimited time doesn't mean you should talk all day about nothing to, to do with the legislation. And I think member statements certainly may well be a way of addressing that and allowing people to um, speak to, to the specific issue. And it means that they're actually using the proper process in order to address what it is they want to address. Okay. So I, I agree with you on that. Jerry, you were looking in. Yeah, thanks. Um, 
Yeah, I agree with you. There's a sort of an attempt to at, at talk about a decision. Um, and I think there, there's a, you know, to be frank as well, I mean, t- I take uh, both you and Linda's point about um, people waffling. Uh, sometimes um, me and others aren't even called uh, in debates at all, despite sitting there for two hours, make, uh, putting time and effort in the, the prep or comments. So just to add that into the consideration, um, but I, I think we need to make a decision around um, frequency, and I, th- you know, I would like to see it preferably both days, both sitting days. But um, can we, as committee, recommend uh, or put into stand orders um, that uh, member statements have to happen not less than once a week, um, and would that provide flexibility for the business committee to, you know, have the option uh, of doing it on both days? But to make sure that it happens at least once a week, because I think that that should be bare minimum, should be should be once a week. Yeah, and <clears throat> Jerry, as a member of a bigger party, I can understand why the other parties, you know, are <clears throat> trying to ensure that as many of their members get speaking as possible bases on to hunt and all the rest. But however, there is there's three options. So there's option one, there's option two, and then the third one is to strike a balance between the two options. So the committee could recommend member statements to be set, scheduled on a weekly basis. And if the business committee are coming back and saying after, you know, whatever meeting, in the way they do, we can't do a German debates or we can't do the statements because we've got X amount of time, then for me, that's fair enough. I think people would understand. But I do think, um, <clears throat> you know, it may be, something that uh, we could each take back to our parties when it comes to legislation um it just ends up a free for all so um so there's what i'm going to do is i'm going to go three option one option two the third and we're just going to vote in each because i think we're around the houses in this to be frank so um option one those in favor of option one I ask uh, broadcasting to move the committee members all into a grid formation so we can manage the vote properly. Carl? Yeah, go for it because I can't see. Yeah. Yeah. Never I, think you. Better. I think it would work better for this purpose. Okay. So has that happened? I'm just requesting that. And then, oh, um, right. and then we'll be, I'll be able to actually physically... Uh, See the hand count, hopefully. Chair, members can turn off their camera. Chair, can I just ask before this goes to a vote? Because when I'm going through the papers, option three isn't that clear to me. I think you're, you're talking about a hybrid between option one and two. It is, yeah. Yeah, okay. So, okay, that's fair enough because, you know, I, I still I've, called do... third, I've called it a third option, Sinead, because for oh, me, right. yeah, it's not, I didn't say that in the papers, obviously, but yeah, for me. Okay. Yeah, it's oh, that's fair enough. I take that point. No, it's just when I considered the two options, it wasn't actually presented as an option. Um, but no, I do take the points made. That's fair enough. Thank you, Chair. 100%. Sinead. Emer has... Yep, good to go now. Okay. Agree what we're taking the vote on, first of all. Okay. So, so can we agree, just for the point that Sinead has just asked for clarification, the paper has two options. And it actually, where I'm suggesting is that we should have had down as an option a third one that we can try and strike a balance between the two. But for clarity, um, can we go for just a vote and then we can come back? So um, we need to vote on those in favour of option one. So... A poll, sorry, sir. Is there a poll coming up? No. Okay, I'm for one. It's a okay. raise the hand function. Okay. So it's just, so I can only see one hand up. Is that correct, Emer? Yes. Okay, so uh, those against option one? One, two, three, four. Five. Linda and Nicola, can I check? Hand up. Six, seven. Seven. Okay, Jerry, you're gloriously defeated. But listen, we're now looking at option two. 
So those in favour of option two? Four. One, two, three, four. Linda, is your hand up? So one, two, three, four, five, four. Okay, those against option two? One, two, three, four. Four against. So it falls? Falls. Okay. Can I put the third option down as a compromise to strike the balance between the two? That we should recommend mem member statements to be on a weekly basis. As an example, unless the committee business committee have agreed that due to time pressures the order paper or with other exceptional circumstances that it couldn't be taken. And this happens as it is with the likes of germ debates and members' business. So I'm putting that out as a proposal. Eimear, maybe you want to put that in different words that it looks like a third option. Um, can I seek advice just from Polly's in the audience here, Chair? Okay. So in the event that there is, there was a majority for option two, can a third option be put? Yes. Can broadcasting bring in Paul, please? There we go. Apologies about that. Hello, Chair. Uh, hello, Committee. Yes, I've been lurking in the audience uh, throughout here, but happy to come in there. Uh, I think there on option two on your proposal, uh, there was a majority actually in favour of it. I think there were five members who voted aye and four who voted against. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think actually there was support there for option two. But but, but having supported option two, there's nothing to prevent you from, from uh, caveating it in the way that this third option suggests. So you've said that the Business Committee should have the discretion to determine when it should be scheduled. Yeah. That's not to say you can also recommend in your report that goes with this that you would expect to see it weekly unless the business committee agreed that there was a particular reason that it shouldn't happen, which exactly. I, I think is what you're my saying as an option three. Yeah, and my interpretation is that even though option two allows a business committee to determine the time and items of business, okay, um, the third would be that, for example... Um, and it should also, and we should also determine what uh, the criteria is for what you can bring up, what you can't bring up, because that needs to be clear as well. But um, <clears throat> but I do think um, there needs to be um, a, a facility to um, for it to be brought in. Uh, to the assembly, you know, like a speaker's compared member statements to matters of the day, which tends to be taken at the start of plenary business. Again, that would be a decision that the business committee would make. You know, it's not up to us to determine when a member statement should be taken. That's the business committee who does that. Um, so what isn't uh, agreed is that it's done on a weekly basis, Paul. That's the only thing that wasn't agreed. So... Yeah, I, I think that what was agreed was that the business committee should have the discretion to determine when it's scheduled. But even if you're saying they should have that discretion, that doesn't prevent you from you as a committee saying, and by the way, we'd like to see this happening weekly. Mm -hmm. uh, and that'll give the business committee a steer. And my expectation is that they will then schedule it weekly if that's, if that's what you're recommending, even though you've given them that discretion. Yeah, but option one... Um, so option one wasn't clear, it just says to allow the business to occur routinely with the great frequency. So basically, and option two um, is something similar, except again, you know, it would be for a matter for the speaker and the business committee to determine how it's taken. So, um, I mean... I think it would be good to go back to the business committee and saying, you know, it is at a discretion of business committee when member statements can be taken. Um, and there would be a view that, that this needs to be a regular occurrence um, because it is down to the speaker rather than the business committee to determine matters of the day where it should be down to the business committee to de determine um, member statements. So... And Sinead wanted to come in there, Carol. Who? Sinead. 
Okay, Sinead, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I suppose we could come at it two ways. I, I look at it nearly the default position is that it, it is a thing and the business committee can put it in place. But what I am conscious of that we may need scope for a business committee not to have the that item of business because the the item it might be or the agenda item it might be or the topic could be repeated throughout the day. So they may say there's no need for this statement at this time because that member will have, you know, maybe other opportunities in that day. So I suppose in that sense, there there should be the opportunity for them not to have to run with it. But given the time slot that it is, I think the default position should be, yes, that they do, that it's sitting there and they run with it and they exclude it if needed. Okay. So... Uh you know, so but we need to we need to determine. So, Paul, we do we need to be definitive to the business committee and the speaker by saying how often it should be there, or what is the position? Well, as you've agreed as a committee now, business committee should have the discretion. That's fine. The draft standing order could be prepared that reflects that, but. If you want, and it sounds like there is a majority of you that think this is the right idea, you should also say that it's your clear expectation that the business committee would schedule this on, on a very frequent basis, for example, weekly, and only in circumstances where there were particular circumstances, for example, workload, we were due to be sitting to midnight because of the number of bills, for example, only in such in, in circumstances such as that would you expect the business committee not to be scheduling it that week? Okay, so members, are you clear that that's what we're, we're setting back? Is everybody content? Apart from Jerry, because he's already made his position clear, which is his prerogative. So are we content to send this back as, as outlined by Paul? Okay, I haven't seen any dissension. So, Emer, are you and Paul clear about what's been sent back as well? Yes, it's clear okay. in terms of frequency. There are two other um, outstanding, so scheduling um, was the next. So, schedule, yeah, so scheduling is really, um, so it's about when or what items should be scheduled. So, for example, um, there needs to be a fixed time set out in standing orders. So it could be for half an hour, three three minutes, as Emer outlined earlier. Um, the recommendation is towards the um, or the start of a sitting. Yes. So, for example, as in the Mother's Day, day yes. there's a clear expectation that the first item of business could be Mother's Day, day or member statements. So everybody's quite clear that needs to be specific in standing orders. Yes. Okay. So, I mean... And the recommended approach. So if we're saying, for example, um, that, <clears throat> you know, it's we, we recommend that it is outlined and scheduled for start of the sitting or sometime in a sitting, um, and it's for whatever amount of time, then that's, that's what needs to be reflected in standing orders. Um, so are we clear on that? Okay, and then frequency. So, the paragraphs eight and nine of Amer's paper. There's two options in relation to frequency. So, option one would allow this business to occur routinely with agreed frequencies, and that's a point that Jerry made. Um, so, um, and uh, option two would be around private members' business or adjournment debates. So that's that. So we've done frequency, we've done scheduling, and what I'd like to do is the restrictions. And I mentioned these very tentatively earlier on, but we need to be very clear. So twenty paragraph twenty of Amer's paper provides us with examples of restrictions from other legislators to accommodate member statements. Um, so we agreed, in, for example, previous discussions. That and we, we seem to be content in this that would have a maximum of three minutes um, to make a contribution, that the statements would be brief um, and would be subject, not subject to debate. So, for example, if there was an item on the order paper for a private member's business, that you wouldn't be bringing a statement in on that same issue. 
So that's what that means. Um, and we should consider where it's, you know, any statements need to be factual. And there's also stuff there about a sub judice as well. I can't see it here, but Paul, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, no, no, you're not. You're, you're not wrong, uh, Chair. There's already uh, provision in standing orders that say that members aren't allowed to refer to matters which are sub judice unless the Speaker has provided for that, and also matters which would amount to a contempt of court court uh, are prohibited. So you don't need to specify that in the restrictions for this. That already applies. Okay, but it's just to remind members that when, because not everybody knows standing orders like you guys, Paul. Um, <laughs> <laughs> even though we, we should, we're really interested in it, but I couldn't, I couldn't point you to it, but I know it's there. So it's just that everyone has a clear understanding of that as well. So assuming that is, then we need to seek um, agreement on um, on our views on this. So, uh, do anybody feel that it should be factual? Is the first question. So that would be the first issue we would ask. It's a given, yeah. really, but we just needed to get confirmation of it, Carol. Yeah. Oh no! I mean, I I thought we had con consensus in that, Emer. Right. So it's just to remind the other. So just to go back to people, is that a understood that it has to be factual? No. Yeah. And sure. then. Sure. Jerry. Just, just clarity. Is that not the, the state of play currently for, for uh, matters of the day and le legislation and, and plenary debates? Surely people have to hear that already. Or is there a specific extra um, stipulation needs to be made? Sorry, no. just for no, I think this is just repetition for the sake of it, but it's it's, for, it's to gain clarity so everybody understands that you can't come in and make a statement that isn't factually correct, that isn't going to cause sub judice or it isn't going to cause contempt to court. Okay. So, I mean, Paul, Amer, am I right in that? Yes, no, it was just not, there wasn't a firm decision taken on it in the last meeting. That's why it's reiterated in this paper. Okay. All of the items, if it's helpful, are on page 70 of the pack. Yeah. The principles that were previously agreed were one to four. Yeah. And then the additional ones are the five to 10 on page 70. And they deal with some of the issues that you raised, Sinead, around, you know, not bringing up topics that are already scheduled or due to be, are already discussed or due to be discussed and all that kind of thing. But I'm trying to um, steer through a decision on each of those elements before going to the whole bundle. Okay. So, or so our members clear then? So we, we did agree from items one to four. We're now being asked to agree the rest until seven and it's on page 70 of the pack. Is there anything there that people feel that hasn't been covered and they, are they content to agree those? I haven't seen any dissension, so I'm just assuming there's consent. Not to do it, just for the sake of a chair, but um, just on the point um, nine, uh, members should not be able to use statements to make allegations about or attack another member or critical party. Um, I mean, obviously, uh, allegations unfounded or shouldn't be made, uh, and you kind of alluded to that with uh, sub judice and, and, and legal stuff, but I mean, surely if, if a member wants to criticise a, a minister or um, uh, a decision be, made by a minister, I mean, is the member statements uh, not designed to, to do that, um, uh, or, or what's the what's the kind of reason or rationale? I mean, yeah, yeah, that's exactly what a member statements for attacking a person or a political party just for the sake of being political is what this refers to. That's my interpretation of it. I mean, if a decision is made by a minister um, on any issue and it's causing concern, you've got hopefully this facility as well as matters of the day or an urgent oral question. I mean, there's this facility or any facility shouldn't be brought in to attack any person or any political party. Um, so, so Emer and uh, Paul, is there anything that's needed to give further sure. verification? 
Just to clarify and provide reassurance there, yeah, I mean, obviously, the, the purpose of a legislature is to hold an executive to account, and that will mean criticisms of, of ministers and their departments from time to time. Uh, I think this restriction is more about personal criticism or party political criticism. So one party criticizing another party about that party position, not about what they're doing in the executive or exercising their functions uh, uh, in the department. So I think it would be in those uh, I think the Speaker, as you know, has written to members recently about respect. He has had some concerns about the tenor of debate at times and the need for members to remain focused on matters to do with policy rather than any individuals. And I think we're, if you're considering putting in a restriction here about not attacking another member or party, that's where we're coming from rather than any sort of limitation on criticising the actions of a minister. Yeah, so, I mean, that's, for me, that's hopefully cleared up, Jerry. Um, I mean, it's absolutely there to uh, hold to account and scrutinise, but it's not a free-for-all. So, and I mean, none of us behave like that anyway, but it's worth repeating. So does that clear everyone? Yeah, I think it makes, it makes sense, Jerry. I, I did need a bit of clarity there because it could be open to interpretation, you know, just reading it uh, at face level. So, yeah, thanks for that. No bother. Um, so we tend to agree then items 1 to 10 on page 70. We've already agreed 1 to 4, so we're asked to agree the rest. So we content? Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Yes, sir. So, um, so now that the, the committee's content, we need to draft a starting order for consideration at our next meeting. That would be the next stage, Shimer, wouldn't it? Yes, that will revert to legal services for advice on that. The okay. other question was, did the committee wish to recommend that this approach be piloted for one session? Well, I don't think, when, I think if we agree to change starting orders, then it's sir, you don't need to pilot it, in my opinion. You know, so once starting orders is agreed, then that's it. Um, and again, like everything, if, if it turns out to be abused, misused, or not an effective use of time, then we'll come back to whoever's on this committee at the next Monday can have a look at that again. And again, the Speaker and the Business Committee have uh, have the flexibility of making a decision that it's it's not working and they can refer it back to us and us to them. So um, that, that would be my own interpretation of it. Has anybody else any views? No. Okay. Is that clear, Emer? Yes, thank you. thank you. Okay, so thank you, Paul. So uh, agenda item seven, legislative consent motions, at page 76 of our packs, Amor provided us with an update on the progress into the uh, uh, ongoing inquiry in DLCMs. Um, we had agreed for a written submission to be prepared for the Westminster inquiry and advised that there's a draft response uh, will be brought to the committee for consideration and probably late May, early June, Neymar, for us to review and, com and consider. Yes. And Tom and I met with, informally, with our counterparts, and Neymar, with our counterparts of the Procedures Committee in Westminster. Um, and we'll, we'll just bring a, a note back to the next meeting, but really just to say that we put on record we weren't content with our ability to scrutinise the, the way the current LCM procedure and process is happening, and um, that we acknowledge that the uh, inquiry currently in Westminster is timely, and they welcomed the fact that we were going to put a written submission into it, accepted some of the concerns that we raised. Um, but certainly, Amor, if you could just draft a wee note of that informal meeting, share it with members, and then we can expect our... Um, Submission to that inquiry by late May, early June. So, are members just to agree, content to agree that? Emer, thank you for that. Okay. Um, and that we can also, um, once we, you know, once we get that note, if there's any other questions that people want to bring to the next meeting, then that's fine. So, agenda item eight, proxy vote and consideration of responses. So page 83, Emer has given us a paper which gives us an update on the committee's review of proxy voting procedures. The paper includes a summary of responses from a number of the political parties and independents regarding the inclusion 
of unforeseen circumstances in the scope of the review. The responses are also included in our meeting papers. So the committee responses have not been received from the Australian Party or People for Profit and our response is also expected from the speaker. So what I'm suggesting is that we just follow up on the outstanding responses and revert back to the committee for our next meeting if we get those back. Is that agreed? Agreed? Okay. Jerry, your hand is raised. Is that there from previous or do you wish to come in on that item? Who's that? Jerry's hand. That was from previous. I was I was happy to give a verbal update, but sure, I'm happy with your proposals. Sure, so we'll stick with that. Give you a bit of time, Jerry. That's so, it. Uh, somebody else. Yeah, somebody else. But a time is right. So, agenda item nine correspondence. There's two items of correspondence, which are page ninety three, and that's an email from the Alliance Party, which asks the committee to consider reviewing the current time frame of the committee stage of a bill. I advise the committee that a review of the statutory period for the committee stage of a bill would be a substantial piece of work. And given that we've already agreed our priorities for the remainder of the mandate, um, uh, are we content, uh, uh, I'm asking if we're content to respond to this request on the basis that we basically have a lot on and that we can't do it in this mandate unless there's other views. So I'm asking you to accept, we can't, but don't have the time Emer, can you see any? Everybody seemed to be okay with that. Just indicated to come in, Carol. Okay, go for it. Uh, I'm just wondering, Chair, what on what what was the basis or what you know what is the particular concern? Do we know? Because the assembly, I mean, in terms of the committee stage, it can be extended. But that has to be by agreement of the assembly. It's not like a committee can decide to extend it, or you know, it's. So I'm just wondering what the what the what the basis for it is. But but and it's sort of irrelevant anyway because you're right. We can't we can't we can't take it on anyway. We wouldn't have the, the time to do it in this mandate. But I mean, that's my own view. Given the the the, pro, the program of work that we have, um, certainly to try and get through stuff before this mandate. Um, but I'm just asking, are there any other country views out there? No. Okay, so we're content that we'll just respond um, and just advise that there's, I mean, the review of the strategy period for any committee stage would be a, would be a substantial piece of work. Um, so we'll just respond on that basis. So... Uh, the other item of correspondence is at page 94, and that's just a publication of the Human Rights Newsletter, um, if we're content to note this item. Okay. And I did... Uh, yeah? I, um, yeah, there was an item of correspondence that was scheduled at page 32 because it related to the NDNA question to the Secretary of State. It just it wasn't noted at that item, if it members can note it now. Okay, agreed. Um, from the Minister of State uh, on the um, his intention to bring forth legislation and we would be in contact in due course. Okay, so that's noted as well. Um, so our forward programme of work at item, agenda item 10, um, just if we're content to agree our forward programme of work and the FEMA can factor in any items of business agreed earlier um, from our meeting into that forward programme work. Um, okay, so we not, that will include all the earlier items of business that we discussed. Um, I have no items under a AOB for discussion. Do any other members have any items under AOB? No? Okay, so Emer, just on behalf of the committee, I want to thank you um, for the work. It was a long meeting. Um, but we've got a lot covered. Um, so our next meeting is Wednesday, the 19th of May at 2.30, Vast Darleaf. The meeting's adjourned. Take care, everybody, and stay safe. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Emer. Bye. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.